We are here to tell you stories. Stories about our research. So, um, at the end, it's all about stories. So it doesn't matter what theory, what methodology, what research project we are working on. We are telling stories here. So um, the, the first story, I guess, that we want to tell you is how we are connected. Um, Rabina and I first met both a couple years ago now um, through some co-writing that we were doing. And uh, eventually, we attended a, a couple conferences together. And we, we've co-written since then. And Rabina, of course, has taught for Suntep Regina, where I work. And uh, we also have, um, well, we have lots of differences between us, mostly height. Um, <laughs> We have quite a lot of similarities. Um, Rabina is from Bangladesh and I'm from Canada, and so we're, we're both uh, products and to some extent of British imperialism and all of its effects on our peoples. Uh, we're both members of racialized groups. Um, we're both academics who work at a university in a teacher education program. And we both have a strong interest in language theory and language planning policy. So uh, we just want to show you where we come from. So I come from Bangladesh. So Bangladesh is a South Asian country. So when people see my skin color, they, is, uh, they make assumptions that I'm from India, uh, Pakistan, Nepal, but not Bangladesh. And when they hear my name, Rubina, they immediately think I am Muslim because my num name sounds like Muslim name. But I do not associate myself with Indian or Pakistan or um, Muslim community because uh, I do not associate myself with India or Pakistan because of geopolitical reasons. We had war between Bangladesh and Pakistan, and uh, we are independent country right now. So I am Bengali because I speak Bangla and I'm Bangladesh. And um, as I mentioned before, I'm, I'm from the Papel Valley. I'm a member of the Michif Nation. And although I have lived in Canada all my life, I don't identify as Canadian. I identify as being a Michif person living in Canada. Um, unlike Rabina, I, um, I have white privilege. Although I'm an Indigenous person, most people would code me or identify me as being a white person before they actually know who I am. Um, and um, yeah, I think that's, that's sort of our context in terms of where we're coming from. So. So we mentioned before, sorry, what, what connects us. This is us on a trip to Brazil, where we were with Dr. Andrew Sturzak and uh, uh, both presenting and, and learning at the ALA conference. And um, yeah, that's us on the left fooling around. <laughs> <laughs> we should have been learning. <laughs> so uh, why story in our research? Especially language policy and planning research, why we are using stories? So I associate myself with Kovach because stories reminds me who I am. So with stories, I am discovering myself and also I'm inventing myself because I forgot who I was. And actually, I did not pay attention to who I was. So I am remembering all these stories. I'm writing down my stories and I am discovering myself. And also, stories and storytelling are political. So it's not just um, my own personal stories. So when I uh, present my research project in the conferences, or when I share my research with my colleagues or my friends, so they always, I get the feedback or questions. How is it different from autobiography? How autoethnography is different from autobiography? Or when I tell them I am doing autoethnography, the immediate reaction I get, oh, you are doing autobiography. But it's not autobiography. Story is not just personal experience, because story is always political. So I am trying to uh, create a bigger picture, or I'm trying to see a bigger picture with my stories. So that's how story is political. I am connecting my stories with others. So when others will read my stories, they will see their stories through my stories. That's how storytelling and stories become political. 
So um, from a miniature perspective, um, our stories largely, uh, up until about 30 years ago, were oral stories, stories that were only passed down around kitchen tables or around campfires. Um, there was very little reflected back at us as mentioned people in either curriculum or in the broader spectrum of literature that represented our culture or our history. That is until, of course, Maria Campbell came along. And those of you uh, who know Maria, you know that she is one of Canada's most revered midship elders. She's also uh, a published author many times over and has been a, a visiting professor at uh, many schools throughout Western and Eastern Canada. And these are some quotes that she has from a book that she wrote about 20 years ago called Stories of the Road Allowance People, where she collected stories from different midship elders using appropriate protocol, of course. And she wrote those stories down in, a, in an English midship vernacular. And so the first one says, I remember a warm kitchen on a stormy night. I'm sitting on the floor with my chicha and the old ladies. The room is full of grandpas, mamas and papas, aunties, uncles and cousins. There's laughter, hot sweet tea and the smell of red willow tobacco. And so what Maria is reminding us here is that there's a relationality to our stories as much of people, that often our stories um, are told in and amongst family members and are usually about family members. Um, stories um, has a, a wide definition in our culture and most often than not stories are just recollections of memories that are sometimes exaggerated or uh, inserted with, with um, uh, pieces of other stories. She goes on to say, no matter how many stories we tell, we'll never be able to tell them what them schools they've done to the peoples and all their relations. So here what she's saying to us is that stories often tell us what we don't know. They often remind us of the gaps in our literature and also in our collective history. She goes on to say, and the stories you know, that's the best treasure of all to leave your family. Everything else on this earth, you get lost or wore out, but the stories, they last forever. And of course, as a, as a largely landless people, um, stories amongst Mitchell people represent our collective wealth and our collective history. You cannot see the picture here, but it's a free drawing style of my storytelling. Okay. I uh, adapted this approach from Chang. So Chang describes um, how to collect memories, personal memories. So one of the tools or strategy is visualizing self. So even visualizing self has three different st uh, strategies, like making a timeline, um, drawing a peer, drawing a place, uh, and drawing your kinship. So here I draw, uh, and also one tool is free drawing. So I'm not a good artist, or I'm not trying to be, so I just use my free drawing style. So in this picture, actually, I captured three things, space, time, and people in my life. So space, um, uh, time, my childhood. So if you see these round figures, so one is my grandma, one is my mom. So in this kinship, I also share similarities with Russ. The, my grandma is my mother's uncle's wife, but she is my grandma. So the closeness we share. So it doesn't matter that she is not my direct grandma, but she is my grandma. So she told me a lot of stories, and most of her stories were folklore. And then my mother. Mother uh, and my father so they told me stories in that part it's also about time afternoon my mother and my father came home during lunch hour and she shared all his stories with us especially his childhood or his crush on some people in when he was young <laughs> so something like that and again my mother shared her story in the evening with me when everything was done, she is free, she's taking rest, and I was doing my homework, she's helping me. So she was telling me all these stories. And all her stories about her childhood, how happy she was, all about happy life, the food she ate. And I remember, I, I always told my mother, why did not you save the good food for me? <laughs> <laughs> and I told her, like, you could buy it all this all this food and saved it for me. Why didn't you do that? And I was really sad <coughs> that she didn't do that for me. So that's the moment. And here is my family, all my three brothers, my parents. And here, the time, space, and people. 
So th this is supper time. So my brother came home at 10 p.m. So we gathered around him and he told us all the stories. But here I want to point out he was a child labor. So he went for work when he was only a boy, 12 or 13 years old. But he, in this moment, he did not tell us how his work was hurt. He told us what he had imagined during his work, all this imagination, what he was thinking. He never shared his hard work. He was always sharing the stories he imagined during the work. And we just listened. We did not share. We just listened to him. Then I also want to share this little girl. She was a little bit older than me, but she was a domestic help. Not my home, my uncle's home. So when I visited my uncle's home, I was her friend. And she was my friend. And again, she told me all the happy stories. She did not share about her work. How, how her work is painful, or how much hard work is she, she is doing. She was telling me all her, about her family, her childhood, her, her friends back home. And research ethics board doesn't permit me to share all the real names, but I want to share her real name. Her name is Anu, because nobody remembered her, I'm sure. Nobody remembers her name. So when I tell her your name in front of all other people, I make this invisible person to visible. And that's the person of the story. That's the power of story, when you make invisible people to visible. I asked her, Bina, why she drew her grandma around, and she said, that's how she looked to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> And I remember that I was touching, I was always playing with her hands, her hands are so soft. That's the feelings I remember about her, that she is round and so soft and so tiny. <laughs> okay, I want to talk about my research a little bit, like about the context. So we are doing language project, so that is my language planning and policy project. So how did it happen? How did it all begin? So. One, one of my friends, a couple of years ago, asked me, why did you study English? And I couldn't answer him, why? I explained, or I used so many gibberish words, but I wasn't happy with my answer. You know, why did I study English? Then I came here, and everybody, everybody was asking me, how did you study English? And then I explained them, oh, English was always there. But then, if English was always there, then how come my English is not standard English? How come I have the accent and it's not proper English? So all this context, all this experience in my life lead to these uh, questions about language policy. So I, were, I started exploring how English went to Bangladesh. Then the historical and stru structural factors came. Then when I was reading about structural and historical factors of English in Bangladesh, then I found, oh, wait a minute. It doesn't uh, tell about my experience. What they are telling in the language policy documents and the experience, my experience with English, it's totally different. Then I found, okay, language policy sustains systems of inequality, but how? That's I'm exploring in my research. And also, I'm trying to understand why I have chosen English to educate myself. Because that was the answer I gave to everyone. I chose English to educate myself. But why English? Why not my mother tongue? But why not other languages? So I am adding my stories with language planning and policy documents. That's how I'm doing autoethnography in my language policy and planning research. So my work involves, um, of course, working at SUNTEP, and um, over the past couple of years it's involved helping to revitalize MICHEF, which is the language of the Métis. Um, SUNTEP Regina has been in existence for 38 years, and, oh god, now I'm nervous. <laughs> Um, during those 38 years, we've always had an indigenous language requirement, 
Um, unfortunately, midship has never been offered at a university up until recently, and so um, our students were taking usually Cree or Soto. Um, and of course, there's nothing wrong with taking any Indigenous language. As you do that, you, you learn new concepts and, and uh, portions of a new worldview. However, it wasn't the worldview of my students, and it wasn't their language. And so um, I was tasked a few years ago by both um, my old people as well as my community and my professional community at Gabriel Dumont Institute to start doing some planning around the development of a midship course. We are now into the second year of our midship course and we continue to learn new things and adapt and um, the course will look uh, a lot different next year because we're taking it from a classroom environment to a land-based environment and it will um, also switch from being a twice a week course to being a three week intensive course. So we're, we're quite looking forward to that. But in terms of language planning and policy, this is the project that I am most interested in at the moment. Okay. So everybody, everybody's common question is what is autoethnography, right? So I will try to explain very simply. So that's the picture I borrowed from Carolyn Ellis, because Carolyn Ellis uh, is, a, is the big scholar in autoethnography. So, and I also like her work, and about autoethnography, I follow her work, and I am inspired by her work. So she drew this picture in her class to explain autoethnography. And she explained that autoethnography is about self, but it's also adding ethnography, which means culture. So autoethnography is connecting self with culture. So with autoethnography, we are describing, as a researcher, I am describing myself uh, to understand my culture and my experience. So that is autoethnography. And in autoethnography, researcher is also a writer. Researcher is also a subject in her research. So I have two roles in my research. So I am a researcher, I am a writer too in my autoethnography. And also, okay, why autoethnography in language planning and policy research? Or why we are using autoethnography in our language for planning and policy research? These are the reasons. Because autoethnography allows us to use our stories. And when we use our stories, we value ourselves. Okay. So it uh, allows us to uh, value ourselves in our research. And also it uh, acknowledges uh, the situatedness of my experience in my context. So I can situate myself in my context with my stories. It um, explains how my culture shapes my own identity because I told you that I'm trying to discover myself. I'm discovering myself with my stories. So, uh, so uh, auto ethnography led me to do that. I like this reason that it's a creative resource of writing. I cannot write the standard English form. I cannot do that. Um, because maybe I did not learn how to do that. So um, according to um, other people, my writing is not that much standard. So I don't feel comfortable with the common writing style. So I write stories in Bangla. Uh, sometimes. So in my writing, I am uh, bringing that storytelling styles. So I feel comfortable with. And with autoethnography methodology, I can do that. And I can argue uh, that I can use storytelling writing style in research writing. And also, it brings a resistant dimension in research and writing. That's very important for me. So I'm resisting uh, to uh, power of language, power of English with, uh, in Bangladesh. In Bangladesh is a post-colonial context. So I am uh, resisting the power of English uh, with my stories. And also in autoethnography as a person, it allows me to articulate my stories, so which makes me comfortable. 
Yeah, from a from a context in terms of our, our midship class, autoethnography becomes increasingly important for my students to understand how and why that language was taken from them. So they, the experiences um, differ uh, depending on which family you're from and which community you're from and what circumstances surrounded the, the loss of that language. And so in my case, um, largely it was due to a move to the city from a rural area. And it's increasingly important for my students to understand how to do autoethnographic work because I think in a lot of Mitchia families there is this, this sense of blame, self-blame of, well, it's, it's our own fault that this language disappeared. Um, and of course, we know that there are lots of socio-political reasons why that language was taken from people. And so as my students engage in autoethnographic work in the Mitchia course, um, they start to uncover these really valuable stories from their own family. And we start to see a, a growing sense of pride emerging in those individual families and also within the self amongst my students. So this is an example of how uh, I am using autoethnography in my research. So I made, uh, I, I used that, that free drawing strategies, visualizing myself. So I created the autobiographical timeline. Here, a uh, timeline about my education life in Bangladesh. And also um, the place. This is a drawing, free drawing about the place, about my house. So Jen, um, she says that uh, you can draw a place which uh, brings a lot of memories to you, which is significant in your life. So my house is really significant. I grew up in that house in Bangladesh, and the house is not there anymore because they changed a lot. I don't recognize it anymore. So the house I grew up, that house doesn't exist anymore. It only exists in my memories. So I drew a picture of my house. And the third picture about the kinship. So the people who contributed to my life, especially about my education. So with that kinship uh, drawing, I try to thank them that they are, they, um, they are significant in my life. So it's a kind of expressing gratitude to them in my research, through my research. So autoethnography allows me to do that. So these are some examples. So and also with all these three things, what I'm trying to do, I'm collecting my memories. And my personal memories is my data source for language planning and policy research. Okay, so in terms of how we use autoethnography, um, Manolo talks about this idea of epistemic disobedience, or delinking is a way out of the coloniality of power from within Western categories of thought. So um, for me, when I was tasked with, with um, helping to revitalize this, this language and to develop this course, um, I knew that I couldn't rely on traditional language pedagogy because that's not the way that my old people, the only speakers left of this language, learn that language. And so in order for me to, to uh, figure out how I could translate that traditional pedagogy from a land-based experience into a classroom experience, it, it required that I do a lot of visiting, essentially. It required, and I, luckily I, I do a lot of visiting anyway with my old people, so that was pretty easy to do. But. Um, it required that I became even uh, a better listener than I was. It required that I uh, humbled myself. And it required that, that when appropriate, that I asked questions about my family's experience in terms of what happened um, to create this situation where in one generation the, the language was lost. And so uh, in this picture here, we're, we're hanging out with Sherry and some of my old people in the valley. This was a research trip that we took oh, probably a couple years ago now, eh, Sherry? Uh, where we're learning about um, where some of the families down in the valley lived on the road allowances and some of the traditional practices and customs that they, um, they practiced on a daily basis. So this idea of delinking uh, was quite a, a difficult one for me, uh, mostly because the only language experience I have has been in formalized institutions. So uh, of course English um, and 10 years of, of core French, which really <laughs> didn't do me any good. Um, 
And so what my old people were saying to me is that you can't, you can't teach that way. You, you realize that through doing autoethnographic reflections that those uh, ways of learning didn't work quite well for you in trying to obtain a second language, so they're not going to work well for your students. Particularly when we're trying to revive a language that uh, has yet to be standardized and has many different dialectical differences from region to region. So. This is one example of how I'm using my stories in my writing, in my research and writing. So autoethnography also makes a uh, researcher or writer vulnerable. Uh, so that's, uh, Carolyn Ellis always cautions us, so you will be vulnerable, so be prepared for that. So I'm going to share these stories with you. So it has been snowing for two days. I am surrounded with whites. I have taken a coffee break from my writing. I don't know why, but this snow white reminds me of Coleridge. Water, water everywhere. I replace the word water and murmur white, white everywhere. I sip my coffee and gaze at the sky. It is so blue. It's like I'm in the middle of a surreal painting of blue and white. Coleridge is gone, but Phileas is now buzzing into my ears. Suddenly I see a teenage girl is sitting on a middle-aged man's lap. The man is kissing on the girl's forehead. The girl goes to school and innocently shares this story with her friends. All her friends start giggling and point to the fact that kissing is not an innocent act. That man was a renowned English teacher in a renowned school in my hometown, Maimensi. He taught English to a group of students at his place outside of school. This private tuition is a common practice in Bangladesh. I was poor at English. My high school uh, final exam year was approaching fast. I would fail my high school final year exam if I failed English. I needed extra English learning support, but it was expensive that I could not afford. My elder cousin sister took me to that English teacher's place and explained my economic situation. That man took me into his lab and kissed my forehead, assured my sister that he would make me good at English and would not have to pay him money. There is a repulsive feeling to wash my forehead whenever I recall this memory. I realize there is a hidden desire to wash off my memories of learning English in Bangladesh. I find it problematic when I am standing in the middle of heavenly beauty of snow and ocean blue sky and remembering the cost I have paid to study English. I do not sit here to write my autobiography, but intend to do autoethnography that present an intentionally vulnerable subject and takes typically feel more self and socially conscious. My autoethnography of language planning and policy is a tale that sometimes reflects its vulnerable tailor through self and socially conscious text. So this is my story. And I have stories like that. So this is not only one story in my life, I have so many stories like that. And this is, it's not only me that have experienced um, that uh, thing, but I, I believe that a lot of girls like me have gone through same experiences, so it becomes a culture. Okay, so I am, this story I did not share with anybody else. It's in my, uh, uh, writing and also I'm sharing here with you. Uh, also these pictures, this, all my, this is a, I made a timeline with all my pictures. So uh, that's the first picture I found about myself uh, and then the last picture when I was in university. So it's a kind of timeline and I did not share this picture with anybody else not even in social media, not even in Facebook. So I'm sharing it here for the first time. Because Ellie said, revealing is painful, but we have to be comfortable with that. Um, I'm trying to be comfortable with my uncomfortable feeling by telling the stories. And I am discovering myself with my stories. That's how autoethnography story and story, storytelling works it makes uh, storyteller powerful. And Ellis said that uh, we are telling stories. Isn't it enough to do a study? So I think it makes sense. I agree with Ellis. We are telling stories, and I think it, sh it should be enough to do a study. 
Um, so I think it's it's probably a bit easier in our context um, in Canada to tell stories. I think we're often encouraged to tell stories. We're often um, praised for telling stories, and so. Um, Stories are can be painful, but they can also be healing in terms of the way that we tell them. And so this is a reflection that I made based on um, some of my people's language experiences. By the time my great-grandparents moved to Saskatchewan, they each spoke four languages. My grandparents spoke three. My mother speaks two, and I speak only one, English. The closer my community existed to settlement and settlers, the less we spoke our indigenous languages, and the more English came to dominate our conversations a secret language that was presented in hushed tones amongst adults around a kitchen table. To the old ones, it was a yoke, heavy in its misinterpretation and isolation, a burden which would prevent the younger generation from moving forward in a white world. This was an assumption that was reinforced with funny looks, funny questions about that funny language, years of speech therapy, and a complete omission of my language and culture in mainstream learning contexts. I did not lose anything. I had opportunities to learn and engage with mischief taken from me the way one rips out the roots of a weed to ensure it does not return. Thankfully, they did not get them all as Mitch of roots run stubbornly deep. So, uh, Rabina said if she put in a picture of her as a kid that I had to put in a picture of me as a kid. So, um, obviously that's me on the left, looking a little lazy. Um, the people on the right are my great-great-grandparents, who each spoke four languages. Um, and so, as I mentioned in the, in the reflection previous to this, uh, with each succeeding generation and with encroaching settlement into Métis territories, um, less and less of those languages were spoken. And so, um, with Michif specifically, it's, it's literally uh, the transmission lost is between my mom's generation and my generation. But prior to that, uh, Métis peoples, it's quite normal for Métis people to be quadrilingual, sometimes you know, speaking five, six languages. Um, and so telling these stories, I think, is healing in a sense because, as I mentioned previously, it helps us as Michis to understand that the, the taking of that language was not through any um, fault of those people. It was through socio-political context which said to them that this is a language that will burden your youth, burden your younger people, and if you want them to exceed in this new economic reality that is settlement, you should pr probably teach them the settler's language and keep it at that. And so it's helped me to understand, because of course growing up, um, I had all sorts of questions about what my mom spoke and, and why she wasn't teaching us. And um, I think your, your first sort of um, inclination in that situation is to say, well, it's her fault because she's not teaching me. Uh, and it was really through doing uh, autoethnographic research that, that I just come to realize that um, in fact they were protecting us and, and trying to ensure our success in life. Uh, but through that, uh, the language itself was, was taken. So, uh, how can autoethnography contribute in uh, language planning and policy research? So, my research, especially my readings, uh, suggest that uh, not so many people used autoethnography in language planning and policy research. I found only two scholars, Kanakaraja, and one Bangladeshi scholar. Uh, they used uh, they used autoethnography in their writing. So that was a literature review paper. They, they were sharing their experience. It's a, um, so they, these two people use autoethnography in language research. I wouldn't say language policy, uh, but it's language research. So I want to contribute, I want to introduce one new methodology in language planning and policy research, especially storytelling approach. Um, Especially, I want to um, provide evidence that story is a very powerful thing, uh, even in uh, language planning and policy research, and uh, we should embrace the power of story in language planning and policy research. Because my observation suggests that traditional methodologies in language policy and planning research, they did not consider stories in research. So that's what I'm trying to do here. And just to enforce that idea, Kana Graja, who Rubina mentioned, said, in order to find answers for the new questions that emerge after disinvention, we have to return to pre-colonial, pre-modern societies 
and the ways language communication was practiced then. So in my context, friendship is very much a language that is practiced in a relational context. And so uh, when I'm trying to replicate those experiences in my classroom, it involves the bringing in of old people, it involves singing, it involves visiting, it involves the establishment of relationships before language can actually take hold. Story is a very strong and powerful data source. And uh, that's, I'm, um, I'm exploring it in my research. So primarily, my data source was only language policy documents. And when I went through those language policy documents, I found that it does not match with my experience. So it doesn't tell the complete story of language planning policy in my context. So when I add my stories, to with uh, policy documents, it, it really becomes a very powerful data, data source for my research. So in my research, I, uh, I see that a story can be a data source and can be a very powerful data source. Absolutely, and um, Dr. Farrell Reset has talked about with that with her kitchen table theory. Um, we've talked about that in, in a paper that we've written about the importance of visiting to reclaim story, and of course, Rubina's memories that she shared with us tell us about the importance of that. It's it's quite um, one story I often hear from from non-Indigenous researchers who aren't well versed in traditional Indigenous uh, research methodology. Um, often they'll they'll sit down at a table and they'll shove a recorder in front of old people and they get nothing. Those old people give them one word answers. And um, what they're not understanding is that they need to they need to somehow provide a catalyst for storytelling. And usually that involves bringing multiple old people together. It usually means the providing of food. It usually means not asking questions at all and just sitting back and getting whatever you get and then interpreting that later on. And so um, story is a data source is important, but it's also important to remember that to, to bring those stories out, there are specific protocols depending on which context you are doing that research in. Storytelling and also resistance and resurgence in, a, in our language policy and planning research. Because in my life, I'm not sure if it's my culture or my family or my country or my history, whatever it taught me, but I was silenced in my country. I was always told, do not, um, you don't have to share your stories because it, it doesn't have any value. You, you, like uh, there are thousands of people like you. So what you can add, uh, or what can you add something new by telling your stories? So I was always shut down. So I did not learn to tell my own stories. So in my research, is giving me opportunity to resist that ideology, resist that attitude. So I am telling my stories to resist that story has value and my story is important too, I can share it. McConey and Pennycook add that language planning research needs to focus not only on the political context in which it operates, but also on the nature of the concepts of language which underpin the different policy options to question not only the real politic, but also the real linguistic of the 20th century. Um, Kathleen Hughes talks about the need not to replicate oppressive linguistic practices when revitalizing a language. And, and so um, the act of resistance in terms of my context is, again, being epistemically disobedient, as Manolo would say, which I actually call um, just following traditional epistemologies. Um, and so that in itself, <laughs> that in itself is an act of resistance, and my people have been known to resist once or twice. Just a few. Just a few. So that is the end of our presentation. Um, we, I think, told probably a very non-linear story, and that was purposeful. We hope that um, we shared a bit about uh, our work that was helpful to you in, in your context. And we are definitely available now for questions, if there are any. Yes. Dr. Tur Tur Tur